Hey, thanks, Sage. Hey, Lisa. Great to see you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andrew. Good morning. It's my honor to welcome you to kick off the summit with the Fireside Chats. And for those of you who are listening, um, Andrew needs no introduction, but I will talk about his latest work nevertheless. He is the founder and CEO of Landing AI. He's the founder of Deep Learning AI, the managing general partner at the AI Fund, and the leader and the creator of the data-centric AI movement. And these are just the latest projects that Andrew is working on. How are you doing today, Andrew? It's so great to have you. Uh, good. I was listening to you talk about the agenda. Uh, actually, a really exciting program that, that you and team have assembled. Uh, also, also, I love the t-shirt, no ML Oops. I've not seen that before. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We're super excited. And uh, it's uh, very generous for all of the speakers to spend time at today's summit sharing some of their learnings, which, which are typically locked up, you know, within the enterprises that never flow out to the community. So I'm really thrilled that we're making this information available for those who are tackling similar challenges. Well, to kick off our, our summit, um, you know, it brings together AI builders who are focused on building production AI applications. And the data-centric AI movement, which you started a few years ago, I think really codified and provided us with a mental framework for achieving a more robust and responsible production AI development. And today, DCAI is one of the key practices in AI adoption across massive enterprises. What are your favorite developments and examples maybe of the DCI impact to date? Yeah, you know, um, thanks, Le. I think for decades, many people have been working on the data on various dimensions of what's now called data-centric AI. I think I was fortunate to be part of a coalescing or bringing together a lot of the people that some of whom have been trying to figure out how to improve the data, you know, for, 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 for even decades. One surprise to me was, um, when some friends and I organized a Neuros workshop, uh, not that the last Neuros, but one before that, it, it was a real surprise to me, just the diversity of applications. You asked me for one favorite application, but to me, one of my favorite things was just um, connecting the community and seeing how you know people in anything from underwater robots to medical images, to large language models, to um, I do a lot of work in computer vision, just field after field, there's this, energy momentum about the importance of engineering the data. In fact, one thing that was interesting was I know that large language models, things like chat GPT um, on a lot of people's minds, I think it was it was interesting how even the transition from you know, GPT-3, GPT-3.5 to chat GPT, a large piece of the recipe to get there, to build chat GPT was um, really clever ways to find people to write conversations. So fundamentally, it was a large model, large large language model, transform 175 billion parameters, why not, um, with really cleverly designed data, plus some of the things, you know, the reinforcement learning feedback. But but even for, I feel like um, data centric AI has a lot of momentum for small data sets, so it's absolutely critical. We have 50 or 100 examples. Let's get those examples right. And even at the other largest end of the models that we talk about in society, the efforts to engineer that data is also significant and very worthwhile. So that's been exciting to see. Fantastic. I know there, you know, ever since the, uh, how do I say this? I, I think the the practice of centering on uh, the data when developing machine learning applications was always kind of lingering somewhere in the background as we were building these applications. But once uh, that NURPS uh, workshop uh, came together and we really, outlined the framework and kind of all agreed on the terminology, that's when the momentum started gaining because we suddenly developed the same vocabulary for, you know, calling these practices. I'm curious, how do you think about the tool chains that are being built? Um, I think there's now quite a momentum behind different categories of tools that are aligning themselves with the practices of DCAI. Are there any specific categories that you're particularly excited about or that have made uh, great progress in the past few years? You know, again, it's, it's, boy, it's a good question. I wish I had a clever answer. But what I see is um, 
tremendous innovation on all parts of the two chain. Um, I'd say one of my favorites is what you and the YLFC are doing. I don't think that, uh, I, I, I know you weren't trying to get me to talk about YLFC, but that, that uh, the observability piece, I think many people underestimate the importance of the post-deployment monitoring. Um, and so driving observability so you can you know easily figure out what on earth happened with my model I just deployed. So you can be alerted to issues and also get the data back from production to fix that. So, so that, that's AI Fund was proud to invest in, 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 in Y Labs. Um, but more broadly, when I look at all parts of the two chain, I see teams um, getting smarter about how to collect data, how to label. Um, Landing AI, you know, which provides software that makes computer vision easy, a company that I lead has been spending a lot of time thinking about um, how to help users improve the quality of the labels and also spot when you know the the, the data or the images aren't as good or the labels aren't as good so you can be very focused on how to improve it. Um, feels like feels like there's a lot of work on the entire two chain actually. But there's one other thing that I'm excited about, which is data-centric AI feels like collectively we're on a path to democratize AI creation. And what I mean by that is um, <clears throat> You know, if you think about what, 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 take a, say you're building a computer vision system, what does that take? People think, oh, you know, let's hire a six, half a dozen machine learning engineers, have them work for it on six to 12 months, at least 100,000 images, you know, because like, well, image is a million, so maybe a large data set, let's budget $50,000 or something for the cloud GPU credits. So we think of these as many people still think of computer vision projects as, significant investments needing large teams and large long periods of time but what i'm seeing at landing ai is that with data-centric ai tools uh can make it much easier for individuals um or very small teams to build and deploy machine learning systems much faster so the project used to take me a year to do that now non people without you know necessarily a Special, special, specialized background in machine learning are now doing in like a month what used to take me a year to do. And the key to that has been data-centric AI because you've asked everyone to write code. That's still challenging for a lot of non-coders, but you ask people to prepare data, that's much more accessible to many people. Wow. It's amazing to see the the democratization effects. And um, thank you for highlighting my labs. I have to admit that when we work with customers and we tend to be kind of in the uh, last mile uh, delivery aspect of the you know machine learning application to production and maintenance there. But when we work with customers who started adopting data centric AI practices earlier in the development, you know, as they were preparing data, as they were labeling data with Snorkel, for example, as they were augmenting data uh, with tools like Y data, they have already developed the mindset that appreciates and uh, recognizes the value of good quality data on their machine learning life cycle. So there's uh, this amazing alignment uh, that already exists. They are already aware of oh, what kind of impacts the data could make on their application, whether they're in the early phases of the development or already in production and they need to monitor for those data. So uh, from the Ylabs perspective, we're definitely witnessing uh, really added momentum and I think added alignment uh, when we come in and work with customers who, who are aligned with the data-centric AI movement. And one of the cool things is is really um, ease of use, right? For, for YLAB's product, but more generally, for many things I see emerging from the data-centric sphere. So, oh, just for those of you that hadn't heard Alyssa or me yak about data-centric AI many, many times, I think just to define it. Uh, and data-centric AI is the discipline of systematically, systematically entering the data to build a successful AI system. And um, whereas we all know data is important, we often think of data as this thing handed to us rather than something that we need to monitor and engineer and fix incorrect labels. And so I think, um, uh, and I think that, you know, ease of use, maybe for decades, um, we tried to build better programmer interfaces with you know, and, 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 and programming is still hard, right? The, the hardest thing about programming is, uh, well, we all know programming still seems to be pretty difficult, despite code generation and, and, and other things. <laughs> Whereas I think tools to let someone visualize what's the production deployment thing doing, did the data drift or did it change? Um, or tools that help someone visualize, you know, drawing rectangles, bounding boxes to indicate the, the, 
whatever the wind the wind turbines i'm trying to find in satellite geospatial imagery well if you mislabel it tools to help you visualize what you mislabel so you can fix the label those tools are somehow more accessible and it's lowering the barrier to entry for a lot of teams so i find that piece of data century ai very exciting uh, absolutely and i'm i i think there's some going to be some questions from the audience on the data centric ai that we'll we'll continue tackling and thanks for defining the term i want to move a little bit towards um as you already briefly mentioned some of the most exciting topic uh, i would say of the last few months which is generative ai uh, there have been you know forecast projections and bets around the latest advancements in generative AI. And I'm curious, uh, what do you think about the use cases which would get adopted this year? I think there's a lot of discussion on which kind of uh, industries and, and which activities would these generative AI models disrupt this year? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I do think generative AI, it is a new paradigm for how we think about building AI systems. And um, just to set this in context, over the last 10-ish years, there have been multiple waves of hype about AI. I think when 10, 15, 20 years, when I think, you know, IBM won Jeopardy, or IBM Watson won Jeopardy, there was a lot of hype. You know, AlphaGo, there was a lot of excitement, also about reinforcement learning. But I think that for some of the earlier waves of PR excitement, the translation to practical impact wasn't there. And if you look at my record, I did not go back at that time and talk up those things because I felt the commercial <laughs> exciting technology progress. It's really breakthroughs, great job, IBM, great job, DeepMind. But I felt that you know the commercial translation was still missing. I do think um, generative AI is different. Uh, and, and, and I think specifically generative AI has people lump together large language models um, like ChatGPT and GPT-3, GPT-3.5, as well as image generation models like you know, diffusion algorithms or stable diffusion, mid-journey, uh, or Dali. Um, I think both are very exciting. The, the translation to lots of applications, I think, will be even more significant for large language models and image generation. Uh, when you look at the buzz and the number of entrepreneurial teams brainstorming applications, I see both for text and for images, but I see somewhat more, I do see more diverse applications, I guess, in the, in the large language model space. Um, it might take, it, I, it, it'll be exciting. It'll be exciting to see how it plays out. Um, there is actually a, a AI fund, which I lead has you know, multiple companies being built by various founders and residents that are using these technologies. Um, I think the application to uh, text generation, you know, various verticalized chatbots, um, various verticalized summaries to help people process information. Um, I think that's exciting. Uh, in the case of image generation, it was interesting to see how lens, uh, you know, uh, generating cool pictures of a person, how it rose, and then also, right, did not say hi, and it actually the the the, the reports were that his revenue runway, um, uh, you know, came down after it peaked relatively quickly. So I think the applications are yet to be worked out in, um, uh, for, for the case of image generation, yet to be worked out in media and content um, generation. But in terms of relevance to data-centric AI, one thing I'm excited about, it may turn out to be niche, is to use generative AI to generate data. It, 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 it'd be interesting to see if, um, for computer vision, instead of you know programming computer graphics simulators to simulate you know self-driving car scenarios or what whatever you want to simulate uh, or generate diverse faces to build a face face recognition systems that 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 are, that, that can recognize diverse uh, appearances and all genders, it'd be interesting to see if uh, image generation algorithms can be a feeder into AI algorithms. So I'm, I'm actually playing with that. Some of my teams are playing with that. So sorry. This organized answer, lot going on. <laughs> I I actually am also super thrilled about this uh, overlap between you know the excitement around synthetic data because it brings huge benefits to our uh, you know to the velocity at which you can develop new applications and generative AI because all of a sudden uh, we have this. I think we are, we've unlocked this potential of generating data that is really complex and and you know very very close to, um, I, you know, blogs, uh, social media, 
uh, posts and things that typically you would have to gather and wouldn't be able to synthetically generate to run experiments. So super, super exciting. And of course, with images. I'm yeah. curious, um, you know, we, we do hear, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just, just to elaborate on that, I think you make a good point. It, it, let me, using um, images as an example, there are some applications like face recognition, self-driving cars that are, you know, just very commercially valuable or well, self-driving cars, drive assistance. But these are applications with massive amounts of investment. Um, and so it has been worthwhile for these verticals for someone to build a highly specialized computer graphics engine to generate lots of pictures of faces or generate lots of your know, pictures or radar readings or LIDAR readings of self-driving car scenarios to train the algorithms for these massive monolithic applications. But for image generation, the startup costs, the upfront investment has been huge. So it's made sense for these applications where building a single you know, machine learning model um, that performs well is so valuable that upfront investment to tune your computer graphics engine has made sense. When I look at the field of AI, I think um, one of the things you know we're collectively not very good at is helping to address that long tail of applications. Instead of solving these hundred million or billion dollar applications, I see tens of thousands of let's call them five million dollar applications. And if you have a five million dollar application, you can't afford to hire twenty engineers or hundred engineers to work on a five million dollar application. So tools like data-centric AI um, are increasing accessibility because teams, you know, we don't need, because it makes it more possible for more teams to engineer the data. And then I think also image generation, um, a little bit out there because I think this is not yet done. So predictions about the future may be wrong, but I think image generation, if you don't need a team to spend long time tuning a specialized computer graphics engine, you can instead call a you know, diffusion algorithm with prompts and, and tune a little bit to generate that data, I think it opens up a lot, of, a lot more opportunities to let people build the custom AI systems they need for this long tail of applications. And I think the tail of AI, these long, these tens of thousands of, you know, one to $5 million value projects, I think in AI, the aggregate value in the tail may be even greater than the value we have seen so far in the head of the distribution where some company builds one ad system or web search system or product recommendation shopping system that generates massive value and that's why i think this democratizing access to ai creation seems like a is something i'm very passionate about as a way to unlock a lot of value for people yeah it's it's like a whole the barriers are removed and the barrier to entry is a lot uh, smaller. So I'm super excited as well to see all of these applications. And I'm actually curious as, as kind of a follow-up question here. So we see a lot of discussion and a lot of awesome new applications that come out of startups and a lot of them are consumer focused these days. Uh, I'm curious as, you know, enterprises are seeing this and they have AI teams and they're also recognizing that the barriers are getting lower and they can build more applications in this long tail. Um, what would, uh, what would your maybe advice would be to them as they're starting to dabble in this relatively, you know, new technology of generative AI and trying to build applications that, you know, either create synthetic data or power certain user experiences? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So <clears throat> for a lot of enterprises starting with AI, so maybe here's one mental model for AI, I think, 99% of the financial value, economic value created by AI as of today, I think is still supervised learning, you know, just learning input output mapping. So for most enterprises um, starting to accelerate the AI adoption, there's still so much unrealized value in supervised learning as a mature field, lots of resources, probably your competitors have done things or their industry, public industry trade reports on recipes for how to apply supervised learning to, to most industries. So. I, just because the media is very buzzy about you know generative AI, I think the short-term opportunities just using supervised learning for most companies will be will be even greater than exploring this new buzzy thing. Um, and then my mental model for AI is um, uh, supervised learning is where most of the action is today by far. Um, uh, I think that generative AI it is a new paradigm for how to build AI that, that I'm confident will grow significantly in value. And if you have a team that's experienced and knows how to think about it, it's certainly worthwhile 
to run experiments, but it is so cutting edge and so researchy. I think that, you know, there are, I think that over the next several years, there'll be plenty of successes and plenty of failures in um, attempts to use generative AI, uh, which is exciting for those of you that, those of us that want to be on the cutting edge and do the buzzy thing, but then <laughs> commercial value don't ask, don't underestimate the amount of value from from just figuring out supervised learning applications as well uh, I, I love i love that advice i i well, there was uh, such a huge wave of excitement about deep learning and even seeing how deep learning you know unsupervised applications have well how successful they have been so far in getting adopted on large scale as you said majority of the value still is in supervised fairly simple models and it takes quite a while to to get it moving to a point where everybody's comfortable and has the right uh people talent skill set infrastructure to start deploying these generative ai applications at scale but nevertheless it's super exciting i'm curious kind of tying this to the data centric ai practices um let's say when it comes to large language models and um you know using these uh apis that are provided by let, let's say open ai most users don't have access to the training data and cannot evaluate its quality how do we think about extending the dcai practices to these types of models yeah so what i'm seeing is that um uh so I think that is what, what I'm seeing is that it's been interesting that uh, there's starting to be um, benchmarks to evaluate these models more systematically. Uh, so even if an individual doesn't have access to training data, I, I, I was excited, for example, when um, Percy Liang, uh, he and others at Stanford started to systematically evaluate different large language models on many different criteria. So they have like a massive, like 150 or I think even longer than 150 page research paper uh, outlining the performance of different models. So despite most people, well, almost all people not having access to training data on some of the closed models, I think that um, these third party reports can give us a sense of how they do on different measures, including accuracy on performance of tasks, as well as things like bias and toxicity, and just on, on more the robust, uh, on more the responsible AI, directly measuring some responsible AI related metrics. And then um, even if a model is black box, I feel like the development of practices in responsible AI means that we can take a model, build a system on top of it, even if it's somewhat black box, and then attempt to put in place metrics and audit the the end-to-end -end performance um, uh, against the metrics that we care about. And that can also you know, hopefully give us some confidence in, in whether or not to use it. Um, and, and then lastly, you know, it's been interesting that uh, um, the uh, we're seen in tech over and over. You know, today's supercomputer that only one or two companies have becomes accessible to everyone in in in, in maybe months and sometimes small numbers of years. I think two times in my life, I think I you know had built or owned or set up what was at that time the world's biggest computer for deep learning. Uh, 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 so I think two moments in my life, I think I controlled the largest, you know, deep learning machine, in, a specialized deep learning machine in the world. But fortunately, it was always superseded, you know, relatively quickly by other teams. <laughs> and bigger things. So it will be months, maybe very small numbers of years. But when I look at the um, uh, open language models, like what uh, Bloom, you know, Big Science is doing, I find, I find efforts like that. And Meta also released a model um, under a more restrictive license, available to researchers, but not for commercial purposes. So I, fi I find efforts like that very encouraging. Uh, so, yeah. That's also removing the, you know, minimizing the barriers and democratizing access, I think, to this technology. There's part of it is a skill set and another part, especially in these large language models, is around getting your hands on enough compute power to, to train them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a I have a really creative and on point question from uh, one of our viewers on YouTube, uh, Josh 
uh, Mackey, he asked ChatGPT what questions he should ask you. And actually, it came up with something very interesting. Um, the question is, how do you see the relationship between humans and AI evolving in the future? And what steps do you believe we need to take to ensure that AI is developed and used ethically? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Oh, interesting question. <laughs> You know, but the, the term relationship is very broad. Um, I think there's maybe two aspects of it. One is just the use of AI. Um, uh, I think that um, one thing I'd love to see is um, democratization of AI creation. And let me just, I, I now said a bit, but let me add to that. Um, I think that AI coding will be the new literacy for, for and, and, and what I mean is hundreds of years ago, uh, human society thought that maybe not everyone needed to be literate. You know, why do you need to read and write? All you need to do is go to the holy building and sit in the audience and listen to the high priests and priestesses and monks read some holy book to you. So why do you need to learn to read and write? Fortunately, society has figured out that if many people are literate, um, then we don't just need the best-selling novelist and the best-selling journalist. And instead, you know, if a lot of people can read and write, it enriches human-to-human -human communication. So today, I think we're in an era of AI when most people are not creators of AI, but instead will rely, we, we rely on the high priests and priestesses in the large tech company. All right. Okay, we're back. Right, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry for the for the brief interruption. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so coming back. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'll, I'll just finish away. And, and, and so I'd love to, um, and I think if we can shift to a place where everyone is empowered to create AI, that will change the nature of AI as a tool where all of us can build custom AI systems on our data. And one reason I think that's important is society has changed so that um, all of us have custom data. You know, every company, even every individual, we actually, um, cameras now outnumber people. You know, we, we have more cameras in the world than people. So all of us have custom, custom data. So the ability for teams or individuals to build a custom AI to process custom data, I think will be an important shift in, in how we view AI, whereas literacy for all, and let's get everyone able to be empowered to use these technologies. I love it. I love it. And speaking about literacy for all, I think this year kicked off with a lot of layoffs across the tech sector and many people who have been affected are actually using this as an opportunity to expand their skill sets, to gain new skills and potentially move to a new career track. And, you know, data science and machine learning and engineering are very, very popular directions. So I'm curious, what's your advice on the technology and skills that people should be paying attention to and, and maybe focusing on? Yeah, actually, my, my heart goes out to everyone affected by, by layoffs. Um, I know that tech has been booming for decades. And so the tragic layoffs were, were a shock to many people that have never gone through this economy. And I speak, and you know, even, even people that weren't laid off, but when their friends were laid off, I, I, I feel like, uh, tech's gone through, has, has been going through a tough time the last few months. So, um, I think that actually one, one thing I feel like all, and, and just one, one, part of that demographic that my that i feel especially um strongly about is uh hopefully i don't get in trouble of saying this but u.s immigration policy is a mess and u.s immigration policy the idea that if someone is laid off you know they get kicked out of the country in in after after having lived here for decades because our policy kept them waiting for a long time for a green card or something i think that's just tragic so i think that um anything we as individuals can do to help the people affected, I hope all of us will, will do. Uh, and I think um, fixing US, US immigration policy, I, I, I wish we would do more to welcome the wonderful people that want to come and live in the United States. Um, and maybe all countries, I'm in the US. Sorry, I'm taking a very US centric view, but really I hope all countries welcome, uh, are welcoming. Sorry, you asked me about advice. I think that today um, machine learning is still a rare and valuable skill set. So anecdotally, what I'm seeing is that even amongst companies that have, you know, had, had layoffs, um, I feel like uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, anecdotally, I don't have data for this, but anecdotally, I see that companies that had put a lot of work to finally build a machine learning team, 
many of them have been loath to, to you know, execute headcount reductions in the machine learning team. And so I think even today, skills in machine learning seems to be a extra layer of, of job security because machine learning is still, still seems to be growing faster than the number of people we have able to do that. So, so I think continuing to invest in, in, your, in your training still seems like a very worthwhile thing to do. I love it. I love it. And if you are not in the machine learning fields, there is a lot of material. And as you were saying, the barrier to kind of <clears throat> ramp up on uh, the knowledge is now becoming more as being more and more lowered. The information is widely accessible. I mean, I'm sure everybody, mostly everybody who's watching us now has at some point taking your Coursera course and that was their forte in the um in this career path. So I'm sure I you know, those those who have been affected and and feel like this could be an opportunity for them to move to the machine learning industry, uh, this is a great time and there's still a huge need. Um, I want to make sure I take another question from from the audience uh, because we have a lot. And um, uh, one of the interesting questions about data-centric AI that came up is um, whether you have some kind of guesstimate uh, or estimate ballpark uh, of how much does data-centric AI, uh, does the move to the data-centric AI practices um, cost for a team? Because you did mention that it um, essentially speeds up your development from years potentially to months. So what is the, uh, cost of moving on to these practices for the team, have you observed? Yeah, I think most teams save a lot of money by moving to these because uh, I've seen teams work on the project for you know a year and make a little bit of progress. And then when they said, we're going to embrace the essential guy, let's just focus on entering the data. Then in the next, you know, like one month, they get the system working that previously had taken them, you know, six months or 12 months and hadn't quite gotten working yet. So what I'm seeing is that, um, when teams uh, embrace the mindset of systematic entering the data, they speed up so much that they, I don't know, I, I just see teams save lots of money left and right. So negative costs. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I, I think there, it's a win-win. Everybody should uh, consider moving on to data-centric AI practices. Um, another maybe last question as we're wrapping up, there are a number of questions that we got from the audience about uh, the content that is being generated, AI generated content, and how it's difficult to recognize it um, currently. And one of the questions uh, came from uh, essentially the perspective of using the content that is to today on the internet to train the models that, you know, the large language models that we have today. And now that the internet is getting filled with AI generated content, how can we prevent future models from being trained on this AI generated content and essentially creating these undesirable feedback loops? Yeah, it seems difficult. This is one of those problems that I don't know if I have a good solution. Um, so if the if the large language model operators are willing to watermark their content, watermarking, even for text, which I know people were skeptical about, but I actually do believe that watermarking for text or uh, for images is a workable technology. But one challenge I see is large companies, companies generating large language models may or may not, you know, be willing to watermark it because that sometimes runs against the interests of their customers. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Certainly lots of new challenges for the current PhD students, a lot of interesting research and developing the metrics and the recognition for for AI generated content and of course watermarking. This has been such a wonderful conversation, Andrew. I really appreciate you coming in and joining us for this uh, fireside chat of the inaugural Robust and Responsible AI Summit. Uh, any closing remarks before we wrap up? No, thanks for having me, Alyssa. Um, I think you have such a such an exciting gen agenda. I, I think uh, I'm excited to see you know all of you gathered to talk about Robust and Responsible AI. Um, the essential AI has a huge role to play in robust and responsive AI. And, and, I, and I just want to say, I hope all of you enjoy the rest of the agenda because it, it actually looks really great. So thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic day.